This program is brought to you by Emory University. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I just want to do, a, I'm going to be doing a few housekeeping things, so you can come on in and hope that you can uh, uh, finish up your lunch if you hadn't had a chance to already. Um, I'm Carol Newman, one of the co-directors of the Center for Transactional Law and Practice here at Emory Law. And my other co-director, Sue Payne, is sitting beside me. And Sue is going to actually deliver our welcoming remarks. More about that later. Um, it has fallen to me, I actually volunteered, to do a few housekeeping announcements, so let me do that. Um, if you'll look at your folders, uh, there is a conference evaluation at the end of the folder, and we want to make sure we get that from you. So before you leave, if you could just fill that out, um, we would really appreciate it because your evaluations are very helpful to us as we plan con the conference. Um, in terms of each of the presentations, you will see evaluation forms in the room, and we would appreciate it if you would fill those out immediately after the presentation. Um, there's wireless inf uh, network information in the folder, so uh, to the extent you need that, make sure you do um, get to that. I want to announce um, uh, Edna Patterson, who I think all of you have met, uh, has worked with the Emory Office of um, Sustainability. And we have, our conference has received green status through the Office of Sustainability. So we're proud that we have done that kind of planning and uh, we have Edna to thank completely for that. Um, shuttles, most of you have gotten here in some way or the other, shuttles and parking lot, but let me tell you a little bit about how you can move around. Uh, for today, the, um, first the parking map is in the folder. For today, there are parking vouchers for you um, and uh, you can pick them up at the registration desk. For tomorrow, you should be able to park in either the lot or the deck. Um, usually the gates are up on Saturday. Um, there are also shuttles, as you know, and the shuttles are in the parking lot that, and you can access them best probably out of the first floor, which is where we will be um, uh, having the rest of our program. The shuttle schedule is in the folder and you can consult that. We do want to uh, let you know, some of you have only looked on the website, uh, but the reception is at 5.30 downstairs. Um, uh, you access that from the first floor. And our dinner honoring Tina Stark will be at the conference center. Um, we will assemble at 7, and um, we're definitely looking forward to that. Now, I've done the truly housekeeping kinds of things. Let me point out a few other things in your schedule, in your folders. Uh, the program is there. We do have one change that we're aware of so far, and that is that two of our speakers could not be here for the first presentation today at 2 o'clock. Um, David Epstein and Shamtali Huck from um, New York uh, were not able to get here because of the aftermath of the storm and um, so we will work with them to get their materials available but unfortunately they can't be with us here today. Um, I want to take a moment to thank all of you who managed to juggle flights, do all kinds of things to get here. Um, we are so appreciative and we certainly would have understood if it had not been possible. Um, then the other things I want to point out, we have um, detailed bios of the speakers, so we're not going to spend time doing a lot of introductions today. And uh, we also have attendee information. We have a great group of people here, and you will scan it and see we have a number of states, um, as well as uh, someone from China, someone from uh, um, uh, Canada, and uh, we have a mix, a good mix of uh, law school representatives as well as practitioners and that of course is the theme of our conference um, from doctrine to practice and we hope that uh, having this wonderful mix will help us have an even more engaged and meaningful conversation finally let's remember the uh, emory exchange for transactional training materials those of you who have attended conferences before know about this and we're hoping that this will get us all inspired to be sharing and um, putting more of the transactional materials on that emory exchange uh, that is something that tina stark started and it's um, a repository of great information and we hope that we can um, update very soon and the other thing is to make sure that those of you who are not on our listserv 
sign up for our listserv. So let me move into the next stage, and this is an extremely important stage. I want to thank the sponsors, because the success of this entire conference is financially enhanced a great deal by our generous sponsors. Bloomberg Law, LexisNexis, Practical Law Company, Thomson Reuters, Transactions, the Tennessee Journal of Business Law, and of course the proceedings of this conference will be um, included in an addition. Um, Westlaw, Walters Kluwer, Aspen Publishers, and we encourage you to stop by their tables and thank them personally on the first floor and also to look at um, some of their products and services. I want to thank our steering committee, Susan Duncan of Louisville, Eric Gouven of Western New England, George Cuny of Tennessee, and Rob Ree of Maryland. Uh, couldn't have done it without them, and most of you speakers know them well because they have been coordinating uh, the presentations for the next two days. Um, I also want to thank the speakers. Hard work in planning and preparing, some of you even harder work in getting here, um, and that we will have a great repository of presentation materials as well. Um, again, see the detailed bios and pictures in the information packet. Some of you have seen our Emory Law School volunteers in the blue t-shirts. They will be around the entire weekend. Uh, they will, are there to help you in any way. If you need any help, just go up to one of them and ask them. Um, and we really appreciate their giving up their time on a Friday and a Saturday to do this, as well as some time in advance. And I have to thank the amazing Emory Law School team who've put all of this together. You've met um, them out at the, uh, at the desk, and I have to ask, um, if, if, there's no way we could have put this on without Edna Patterson, our transactional program associate and the event coordinator extraordinaire. I know all of you have been communicating with her, so let's give her a hand. And now, let me turn to uh, the real part of this welcome. Today, we are pleased that you are joining us in really two special celebrations and milestones in our Center for Transactional Law and Practice. The first you know about, and you're already excited. We will honor Tina Stark, our founding director, tonight at dinner, and I hope that, I know a number of you are planning to attend, and I hope that those of you who are not able to attend will be able to uh, greet and uh, speak with her while she's here today and tomorrow. And the second thing is that we are going to celebrate and welcome Sue Payne as our next director. Um, Sue has uh, looked at, uh, uh, from, let me back up. Sue has taken a step back this fall to think about what her remarks might be today. And we've had some wonderful conversations with some of the steering committee and others about what her remarks might be today. I think we're in store for a wonderful transition. I'm excited that Sue is here. And so I'm just going to turn this over to Sue for the rest of this hour. Hi. Thank you, Carol, my esteemed co-director and my very dear friend for that introduction. And welcome to everyone to my new homes, Atlanta, Georgia. I'm from Chicago originally, and also Emory Law School. Um, thank you to those of you who braved Hurricane Sandy, as Carol mentioned, and its aftermath to get here. And to those of you who didn't make it, uh, maybe you'll hear this someday, we are thinking about you and we are wishing you all well. Before I begin, I do have one announcement to make. And here it is. Save the date. Emory Law's fourth biennial conference on transactional education will be June 6th and 7th, 2014. So those of you who like to think of HEAD, um, certainly we will post this as well and make sure that you get it electronically, but here is our little save the date card. I know that we will come together in 2014 and we'll have made even more progress than we've always made. So before I begin my speech, I just want to take a brief moment to do what I always tell my contract drafting students to do, consider my audience. So I know that if, I, uh, if everyone was able to make it here today, we would have 115 law professors, adjunct law professors, clinicians, practitioners, and consultants. 
And I think Carol may have mentioned from 56 different law schools and seven law firms, 29 different states, plus one participant from Canada and one from China. So it's very exciting to have you all here. And I am awestruck by my audience. Thank you to all of you for being here. The title of my speech is In Dreams Begin Responsibilities a five-step plan for the continued development of transactional law and skills education. I remember the first time I heard the phrase, in dreams begin responsibilities. I was an English major in college, and we were assigned to read a short story by Delmore Schwartz. Some of you may have read it. I quickly forgot the story itself, but the title etched itself into my brain. In dreams begin responsibilities. As many of you know, I just started my new job at Emory as co-executive director of the Center for Transactional Law and Practice in September. So I suppose it's not unusual for me to be thinking so much about responsibilities. I'm sure that many of you remember coming to this conference in 2008 when Tina Stark kicked off the proceedings by talking about her fantasy curriculum. Um, it, it was a G-rated fantasy, as I recall. <laughs> Tina spoke about her dreams for an integrated transactional curriculum, not just one course or a loose collection of courses, but a, a course of study, a curriculum, with one course that built upon another and became more sophisticated. Two years later, at our 2010 conference, Tina reported on the state of transactional education. She said, quote, perhaps our biggest challenge is convincing our schools that they should expand their transactional skills curricula. We have for years labored in the shadows of litigation skills training, something our colleagues understand and therefore support. Deal work they do not get. The problem is not just a lack of understanding, but that we labor anonymously. We are nearly invisible within the academy. It's safe to say that over the years, our law schools have begun to expand their transactional skills curricula. The American Bar Association recently released a report, a survey of law school curricula, 2002 to 2010, indicating that since 2002, law schools have made progress toward growth in all aspects of skills instruction, including clinical simulation and externships. According to the survey, quote, law schools offer a wide range of professional skills opportunities. And then they also add transactional drafting courses and upper division legal writing courses experienced the greatest growth. The ABA survey demonstrates that by 2010, many law schools had added skills courses to their course offerings, but most had fallen far short of achieving an integrated transactional law and skills curriculum like the one that populates Tina Stark's fantasy. Of course, it is now 2012, and the just released ABA survey I've been talking about is really out of date. And your presence here today and the rich array of presentations we have on our conference schedule indicates that we have made a lot of progress but there is still so much to be done. According to a survey of law firm training and development professionals taken more recently, in the summer of 2011, students are still graduating from law school without a sufficient understanding of business contracts, especially how and why contracts are structured in particular ways. Moreover, they have inadequate contract drafting skills, lack business and financial literacy, and have no feel or sense for business deals. Additionally, as one author writing in 2012 notes, quote, contemporary law schools have in general failed to grasp, much less embrace, the notion that they are preparing future lawyers to enter the legal profession. Over the past two decades, law firms' chief demand has been for new associates to come in the door with sufficient legal knowledge and skills to handle basic commercial and litigation matters under minimal supervision. I know it's a cliche to say hit the ground running, but the contract drafter in me wants to shorten up that long phrase, come in the door with sufficient legal knowledge and skills to handle basic commercial and litigation matters under minimal supervision. Put another way, legal employers want law graduates to be practice ready. So it appears as if there may still be an education to profession disjunction. And that is the disjunction that engendered the theme of this conference, 
preparing the transactional lawyer from doctrine to practice. At this conference, we will be talking and learning about topics ranging from how to read a contract and deal with risk to how to identify and teach other critical lawyering skills. From how to teach students to understand financial statements to how to measure and assess students' progress. From how to integrate transactional skills into first year and upper level courses to how to teach transactional skills to international students. And much, much more. So as we celebrate our accomplishments and share them with our colleagues, I would also like us to be talking about the future. How can we foster the continued development of transactional law and skills education? I have a five-step plan. Step one, work to make ourselves more visible within our institutions. In order for those of us who are transactional law and skills educators to become more visible within our own institutions, we have to achieve what is known as faculty buy-in. That is, we have to get the rest of the law school faculty to see us and to appreciate and support what we do. One thing that I've learned after nearly eight years in academia is that it's very difficult to know what all of your colleagues are doing. And it's an easy bet that many of them don't know what you are doing either. So in short, to obtain faculty buy-in, we have to do a lot of talking. We must take every opportunity to educate our colleagues about the need for transactional law and skills education. And we must take every opportunity to tell our colleagues about our courses, our curricula, our programs, our centers, our clinics, and yes, even our conferences. At the same time, we have to make sure that our colleagues know how much we appreciate and support what they do. In reality, our missions are intertwined. I was very fond of the title of this conference when we first chose it, Preparing the Transactional Lawyer from Doctrine to Practice. But I recognize now that it may unintentionally perpetuate what David Moss and Deborah Moss Curtis in uh, their excellent book, called Reforming Legal Education Law School at the Crossroads. They call it the false dichotomy between practical versus the theoretical. We have to let our colleagues know that we do not believe that doctrine and practice are mutually exclusive. We can do this by creating rigorous curricula with strong business law foundations. We can build relationships with our colleagues who teach doctrinal courses, like contracts and property, for example, and offer to help them integrate some practical skills training into those courses. And we can invite those colleagues into our classrooms to observe what we are doing, and even to participate in simulations or to listen to student presentations. We have to work hard to obtain faculty buy-in because we need it in order to grow our programs. And in order to grow our programs, we need the faculty to support the hiring of additional full-time faculty with significant practice experience. We need those full-time professors because they can devote themselves to preparing courses, planning curricula, and teaching. Having more full-time professors with practice experience in our programs will also allow some of us to teach core foundational courses, like contracts, in a way that integrates practical skills training. More full-time professors with practice experience will also provide us with more of an infrastructure to manage a transactional law concentration or program efficiently and to support the work of our dedicated adjunct professors. I honor all of our adjuncts, some of whom are here in the audience today. I can see you out there. I want them to feel they are an integral part of our community, and I want to encourage them to help us shape the courses they teach. Having more full-time faculty in our programs will allow us to spend more time with our adjuncts, listening and learning from the people who have genuine insight into what practice ready really means. Step two, get the legal employers to hire our graduates because of the transactional law and skills training they have received. For transactional law and skills training to thrive, we have to get results. This means that our practice ready graduates have to find jobs as transactional attorneys. To help them find jobs, we have to teach them how to talk to a variety of legal employers about the skills they acquired through our courses and programs. If they want to be transactional attorneys, we can teach them to say 
This is what I already know how to do and to tailor that list according to the kind of job for which they are applying. For we know that different transactional law practices have different needs and most likely define practice ready in different ways. Case in point, in a recent article, some general counsels of corporations imagined what a school to train GCs would look like. And in dreaming up this fantasy school, one GC said she would teach students, quote, accounting, microeconomics, communication skills, and negotiation, as well as how to foresee consequences, slow down reaction times, and get the whole enterprise rowing in the same direction. We must try to get other legal employers to articulate what practice ready means. Many large firms have already done this, in effect, by creating competency models for their attorneys, specifying what they need to know at different points in their careers. But what about smaller firms? Does a student who interviews with a smaller firm need the same skills to be practice ready as she would in a big law firm? In short, we need to collect data about what practice ready means to various kinds of legal employers. Once we gather the data, we can work on convincing employers to make their hiring decisions based on whether students fit the practice ready criteria rather than based just on whether they are in the top 10% of their law school class. Getting the legal employers to hire our students is essential for the continued development of transactional law and skills education. Just as we spend a lot of time educating our own institutions, we have to educate legal employers as well. And this involves more talking. I have learned that as legal education reformers, we must be big talkers. Our jobs involve a huge public relations piece. I see myself out in the legal community talking to practitioners about our program and specifically about what skills our students have when they graduate. I expect to be interacting frequently with alumni, bar associations, business law groups, law firms, corporate counsel associations, and a whole host of other groups with my primary goal of getting the word out about our program and urging legal employers to hire graduates of our program. I think that we must all do this in order to get results that will make transactional law and skills education thrive. Step three be early adopters of technology and other innovative teaching schools, tools. Many of you may be familiar with the terms used by Everett Rogers in a book called Diffusions of Innovations, published in 1962. And Rogers proposed that the rate at which people adopt new ideas divides us into five groups. Innovators, early adopters, early majority adopters, late adopters, and laggards. He suggests that if you are trying to persuade the masses that a new idea is a good one, you first have to convince the innovators and the early adopters. Presumably then the others are more likely to follow. Every one of us must have a laggard in our lives. That one person who still doesn't have a voice mail uh, answer machine or a cell phone, or perhaps an elderly mother who has a cell phone but never turns it on, my mom. Uh, had to get my mom in the speech. <laughs> in step three of my plan, I recommend we all be innovators and early adopters of technology and other innovative teaching tools. I believe that these things have the potential to contribute significantly to the continued growth of transactional law and skills education. Let's talk first about technology briefly. I recently learned on the Legal Skills Professor's blog from some James B. Levy, it's one of my favorite blogs, about a study conducted by EduCause, a nonprofit that advocates for technology in higher ed. The results show that undergraduate students are downright thirsty for the use of more technology in the classroom. The numbers rose significantly from when the same study was conducted in 2010. Undergraduates want their professors to make more use of learning management systems like TWEN and Blackboard, open educational resources like free online podcasts and courses, web-based videos, and game-based learning. That's one of my favorites. Are law students very far from undergraduates when it comes to their thirst for technology in the classroom? I, I think not although I sometimes believe I can't stuff one more piece of technology into my life or one more piece of technological know-how into my head, I recognize the importance of embracing the use of technology in my teaching. 
I believe it's important because it engages and motivates the students and because engagement and motivation foster learning. But beyond that, we can use technology interactively. As any of you who has ever participated in one of Professor Okamoto's law meets can testify. I sometimes encounter in resistance in my own brain, and uh, it actually tends to fall just short of being an early adopter. But then I have to ask myself, why not try it? But I also recommend incorporating as much simulation into the classroom as possible, from dividing your classes up into virtual law firms to having students interview clients played by actors, or in my case, usually played by myself. The more real you can make the situation, the better. I've even gone so far as dropping an emergency assignment on my students unexpectedly, just the way it would happen in law practice. This sometimes makes me pretty unpopular. <laughs> By the way, I think I got that idea from someone at one of these conferences. So I don't remember who it was, so I'm sorry not to give credit. Of course, in one sense, we are all already innovators and early adopters, for we are reforming legal education by incorporating more transactional law and skills training into the curriculum. You know, in the old days, it used to be that law students were trained to be litigators, period, in my day and other days. <laughs> now many of our students can take another path. I believe that one day during a job interview, the interview, the student says, I took contract drafting and deal skills, for example. The interviewer won't respond with, wow, I sure wish they offered courses like that when I was in law school. Of course, some of our students will be eventually becoming the interviewers, which hopefully will make them hire more of our students. One tangential point about this step. We need to keep an open mind regarding changes in the legal profession in general. And this means listening when people talk about changes in how corporate law is practiced. In a 2011 article, William Henderson points out that corporate clients are pressuring their outside counsel to do more with less. I specifically remember doing that when I was in-house at a corporation. Henderson says that this pressure to do more with less means that, quote, over the next several years, lawyers working for large corporations will increasingly layer the skills of project manager on top of their specialized legal knowledge. At least one other professor agrees, Professor Richard Suskind. He recently suggested that the role of lawyers is changing rapidly. He predicts that soon lawyers will be working with legal technologists dual qualified people who can build computer systems for use in the law, and legal process analysts who break work down and find the best way of sourcing it. The lawyer slash, slash project manager's jobs will be to bring all of the work together into some kind of a coherent whole. Consequently, Professor Suskind would like law students to have the opportunity to study current and future trends in legal services, and also new legal skills such as project management, risk management, and process analysis. And I quote, it is vital for lawyers of the future to be trained in project management skills. If we don't do it, Accenture's going to do it. Ernst & Young will do it. Some other organization will do it. And lawyers will be relegated to being subcontractors on major deals and disputes. I am not saying we should all start teaching project management skills to law students right away. I'm sure that there are some innovators and early adopters out there who are already doing it. I am recommending that we keep our ears to the ground and we remain flexible enough to adopt our curricula to meet changing needs. Step four, engage in dialogue about transactional law and skills education with our own, within our own ranks and with practitioners. This is actually a, sort of a three-step, step four. Produce scholarship that increases our visibility within the academy. So conferences like this one give transactional law and skills education a huge boost. They encourage us to talk to each other about what we're doing. And this type of dialogue is invaluable and it's exciting as well. I know that each one of us will go home with some big ideas, maybe to pitch to your own law schools, and with many smaller things to try out in the classroom the next day, possibly. So um, I'm echoing what Carol was saying about let's keep this conversation going. Um, on the deals list serve that Emory has is one place. Um, it is easy to sign up for it. Go to our website and you will find it. 
I am going to make a pledge to re-energize that deals list serve by posting something at least once a month and kind of encouraging all of you to respond and otherwise working to facilitate any discussions that we get going up there. Um, and then the Emory Exchange, which is going to be the repository of the teaching materials today that are provided today as well as anything else that you're, you're willing to, to uh, add to the Emory Exchange would be great. I pledge to post my favorite exercise regarding analyzing the business issues in a contract using Tina Stark's five-pronged approach. <laughs> you must stay, Tina. Okay, so my favorite exercise involves having the students analyze turkey grower contracts between Jenny O and the turkey growers. Um, and I do have the students represent the turkey growers as they're looking at the contract. Really appropriate, Thanksgiving's coming up, and you know, there's a lot in the, in the exercise about bumblefoot, which is this disease that the turkeys get in their claws, et cetera. Anyway, it makes you wanna seriously consider becoming a vegetarian. I'm gonna post that, and that's gonna be, I'm gonna be deposited in the Emory Exchange, send you something from the deal list serve, letting you all know it's up there in case you wanna use it. I trust that you too will begin to share things with us more often. Really look forward to seeing what you do. And of course, there are numerous other places that are where we're already conducting dialogues. There's the Kaufman Foundation listserv. There are the Legal Skills Professors blog, which I mentioned earlier and which I really like. Please contribute to those things. Keep this dialogue going. Um, and then I want to make sure you're all aware of a very important initiative that we should all support. We can attend the Association of American Law Schools annual meeting in New Orleans, January 4th through 7th and support the Section on Transactional Law and Skills, which was formed in 2011, largely due to Tina Stark's efforts. She's hiding again. <laughs> this, year, <laughs> this year, the section's program is called Researching and Teaching Transactional Law and Skills in an Increasingly Global World. Um, for more information about the AALS Section on Transactional Law and Skills, you can talk to two of our conference participants. Joan Hemingway from the University of Tennessee College of Law chairs the section, and Eric Guven from Western New England University School of Law is chair-elect. And they encourage you to sign up to be members of this section. Um, and you can find out information on the AALS website and talk to Joan and Eric about how to navigate that site. When I was preparing for this speech, though, I wanted to mention that I came across something um, written called the Petition for Provisional Status for the Proposed Double ALS Section on Transactional Law and Practice. And I recommend that all of you read it if you haven't seen it. It has this, I think you'll find it inspirational. It has a great paragraph in it, and I'm going to read it to you. On the importance of the new section, the petition states, quote, Transactional lawyering is a distinctive form of legal practice that focuses on the creation of a law of the deal, rather than on the interpretation of legal texts or the litigation and resolution of disputes. This sort of lawyering, often called private ordering, depends on the parties, not the government or the courts, to create the rules that will govern their relationship. I love how succinctly that paragraph sums up what makes transactional lawyering unique. In fact, I'm going to try to memorize that paragraph after this conference. So the second part of this step four requires that we engage transactional law practitioners in a dialogue about transactional law and skills education. I recommend seeking out those practitioners in many contexts to tell them what we're doing, ask them what they think we should be doing, establish relationships with them, and bring them into the law school whenever you can. Finally, step four involves producing scholarship that will make us more visible in the academy. In short, we need to write about our work and get our articles and books published. I acknowledge that publication is a fairly traditional path to more visibility within the academy. But I think we should be willing to take that path because it is likely to bring us closer to faculty buy-in, which we know we need for the continued development of transactional law and skills education. The question is whether we have to write the kind of scholarship that generally appears in the average law review. Or can we work to broaden the definition of what counts as scholarship? Perhaps we can even get a discussion going on the listserv about this topic. 
But I wanted to tell you about an article I discovered that's not yet been published by Professor John Nolan. It will be coming out in the Pace Law Review in the summer of 2013. Towards Engaged Scholarship. Uh, Professor Nolan actually was kind enough to send me a copy of the article. Uh, but it points out that the Carnegie Report and the Best Practices Report have generated lots of literature about how law professors can improve their teaching methods, how law schools can alter their curricula, how the legal academy as a whole can prioritize skills training. However, in Professor Nolan's words, quote, much less attention has been paid to the connection between legal scholarship and practice-oriented teaching. He adds that, quote, as the Legal Academy focuses its attention on best practices in teaching, there is opportunity to hold a complementary conversation about best practices in scholarship and to question the prevailing assumption that scholarship is an act largely separate from our teaching and our service." Close quote. So step four of my plan involves producing scholarship, maybe it's a different kind of scholarship, about transactional law and skills education, getting our books and articles published. Of course, if you, you have already taken a step closer to that, if you're a presenter today, because these proceedings are going to be published, as Carol, I think, mentioned, in a special issue of Transactions, the Tennessee Journal of Business Law, um, thanks to George Cuny, and one, uh, he was one of the members of the steering committee, and also to the University of Tennessee College of Law for that. Water. Step five. Assess our goals and programs to see if we are meeting our goals. To foster the continued development of transactional law and skills education, we must assess our courses and programs to see if we are achieving what we set out to do. Are our students graduating with the transactional law foundation and skills they need to be practice ready? Are our graduates finding jobs as transactional attorneys? Is there a connection between the transactional law and skills training our students receive and the jobs that they secure? Once they are working as transactional attorneys, do they find that they have been adequately prepared? As transactional law and skills educators, we have to collect data in order to help us achieve that elusive faculty buy-in that I spoke about earlier. Because as Professors Moss and Curtis, the editors of Reforming Legal Education, point out, quote, Data can be utilized to foster dissatisfaction with the status quo and diminish any resistance surrounding the need to reform. For that reason, the editors advocate fostering an enduring culture of accountability where connecting inputs with outputs is key. An assessment is a word you frequently hear echoing down the halls in law schools these days. Perhaps it's because the ABA's accreditation practices are getting more focused on learning outcomes. As a result, according to Professor Herbert Ramey, quote, law schools will have to alter their assessment practices in order to more accurately determine the extent to which students are mastering the skills needed to become effective practitioners of law. I recommend that we be in the forefront of the accountability movement. For one thing, I want to know whether our students are learning what they need to know to be practice-ready transactional attorneys when they graduate. That knowledge will help us shape the curriculum going forward. So in conclusion, when you dream big, you have to take responsibility for those dreams. My five-step plan for the continued development of transactional law and skills education is just a start, and I acknowledge that. But in my view, we must work to make ourselves more visible within our own institutions, Get the legal employers to hire our graduates. Be early adopters of technology and other innovative teaching tools. Engage in dialogue with each other and with practitioners. Produce scholarship. Assess our courses and programs to see if we are meeting our goals. Thank you.